I am indebted to Mr. Henry B. Northup and others for many of the particulars contained in this chapter. The letter written by Bass, directed to Parker and Perry, and which was deposited in the post office in Marksville on the 15th day of August, 1852, arrived at Saratoga in the early part of September. Some time previous to this, Anne had removed to Glens Falls, Warren County, where she had charge of the kitchen in Carpenter's Hotel. She kept house, however, lodging with our children, and was only absent from them during such time as the discharge of her duties in the hotel required. Messrs. Parker and Perry, on receipt of the letter, forwarded it immediately to Anne. On reading it, the children were all excitement, and, without delay, hastened to the neighbouring village of Sandy Hill to consult Henry B. Northup and obtain his advice and assistance in the matter. Upon examination, that gentleman found among the statutes of the state an act providing for the recovery of free citizens from slavery. It was passed May 14, 1840, and is entitled, An Act More Effectually to Protect the Free Citizens of This State from Being Kidnapped or Reduced to Slavery. It provides that it shall be the duty of the governor, upon the receipt of satisfactory information that any free citizen or inhabitant of this state is wrongfully held in another state or territory of the United States, upon the allegation or pretense that such person is a slave, or by colour of any usage or rule of law is deemed or taken to be a slave, to take such measures to procure the restoration of such person to liberty as he shall deem necessary and to that end he is authorised to appoint and employ an agent, and directed to furnish him with such credentials and instructions as will be likely to accomplish the object of his appointment. It requires the agent so appointed to proceed to collect the proper proof to establish the right of such person to his freedom, to perform such journeys, take such measures, institute such legal proceedings, etc., as may be necessary to return such person to this state, and charges all expenses incurred in carrying the act into effect upon monies not otherwise appropriated in the treasury see appendix a it was necessary to establish two facts to the satisfaction of the governor first that i was a free citizen of new york and secondly that i was wrongfully held in bondage as to the first point there was no difficulty all the older inhabitants in the vicinity being ready to testify to it the second point rested entirely upon the letter to Parker and Perry, written in an unknown hand, and upon the letter penned on board the brig Orleans, which, unfortunately, had been mislaid or lost. A memorial was prepared, directed to His Excellency Governor Hunt, setting forth her marriage, my departure to Washington City, the receipt of the letters, that I was a free citizen, and such other facts as were deemed important and was signed and verified by Anne. Accompanying this memorial were several affidavits of prominent citizens of Sandy Hill and Fort Edward, corroborating fully the statements it contained, and also a request of several well-known gentlemen to the Governor that Henry B. Northup be appointed agent under the Legislative Act. On reading the memorial and affidavits, His Excellency took a lively interest in the matter, and on the 23rd day of November, 1852, under the seal of the state, constituted, appointed and employed Henry B. Northup Esquire, an agent, with full power to effect my restoration, and to take such measures as would be most likely to accomplish it, and instructing him to proceed to Louisiana with all convenient dispatch. See Appendix B. The pressing nature of Mr. Northup's professional and political engagements delayed his departure until December. On the 14th day of that month, he left Sandy Hill and proceeded to Washington. The Honorable Pierre Soule, Senator in Congress from Louisiana, Honorable Mr. Conrad, Secretary of War, and Judge Nelson of the Supreme Court of the United States, upon hearing a statement of the facts and examining his commission and certified copies of the memorial and affidavits, furnished him with open letters to gentlemen in Louisiana, strongly urging their assistance in accomplishing the object of his appointment. Senator Soule especially interested himself in the matter, insisting, in forcible language, that it was the duty and interest of every planter in his state to aid in restoring me to freedom, 
and trusted the sentiments of honour and justice in the bosom of every citizen of the commonwealth would enlist him at once in my behalf having obtained these valuable letters mr northup returned to baltimore and proceeded from thence to pittsburgh it was his original intention under advice of friends at washington to go directly to new orleans and consult the authorities of that city providentially however on arriving at the mouth of red river he changed his mind had he continued on he would not have met with bass in which case the search for me would probably have been fruitless taking passage on the first steamer that arrived he pursued his journey up red river a sluggish winding stream flowing through a vast region of primitive forests and impenetrable swamps almost wholly destitute of inhabitants about nine o'clock in the forenoon january the first eighteen fifty three he left the steamboat at marksville and proceeded directly to marksville courthouse a small village four miles in the interior from the fact that the letter to messrs parker and perry was postmarked at marksville it was supposed by him that i was in that place or its immediate vicinity on reaching this town he at once laid his business before the hon john p waddill a legal gentleman of distinction and a man of fine genius and most noble impulses after reading the letters and documents presented him and listening to a representation of the circumstances under which i had been carried away into captivity mr waddill at once proffered his services and entered into the affair with great zeal and earnestness he in common with others of like elevated character looked upon the kidnapper with abhorrence the title of his fellow parishioners and clients to the property which constituted the larger proportion of their wealth not only depended upon the good faith in which slave sales were transacted but he was a man in whose honourable heart emotions of indignation were aroused by such an instance of injustice marksville although occupying a prominent position and standing out in impressive italics on the map of louisiana is in fact but a small and insignificant hamlet aside from the tavern kept by a jolly and generous boniface the courthouse inhabited by lawless cows and swine in the seasons of vacation and a high gallows with its dissevered rope dangling in the air there is little to attract the attention of the stranger solomon northup was a name mr waddill had never heard but he was confident that if there was a slave bearing that appellation in marksville or vicinity his black boy tom would know him tom was accordingly called but in all his extensive circle of acquaintances there was no such personage the letter to parker and perry was dated at bayou Boeuf. at this place therefore the conclusion was i must be sought but here a difficulty suggested itself of a very grave character indeed bayou Boeuf, at its nearest point was twenty-three miles distant and was the name applied to the section of country extending between fifty and a hundred miles on both sides of that stream thousands and thousands of slaves resided upon its shores the remarkable richness and fertility of the soil having attracted thither a great number of planters the information in the letter was so vague and indefinite as to render it difficult to conclude upon any specific course of proceeding it was finally determined however as the only plan that presented any prospect of success that northup and the brother of waddill a student in the office of the latter would repair to the bayou and travelling up one side and down the other its whole length inquire at each plantation for me mr waddill tendered the use of his carriage and it was definitely arranged that they should start upon the excursion early monday morning it will be seen at once that this course in all probability would have resulted unsuccessfully it would have been impossible for them to have gone into the fields and examine all the gangs at work they were not aware that i was known only as platt and had they inquired of epps himself he would have stated truly that he knew nothing of solomon northup the arrangement being adopted however there was nothing further to be done until sunday had elapsed the conversation between messrs northup and waddill in the course of the afternoon turned upon new york politics i can scarcely comprehend the nice distinctions and shades of political parties in your state observed mr waddill i read of soft shells and hard shells hunkers and barn burners 
woolly heads and silver greys and am unable to understand the precise difference between them pray what is it mr northup refilling his pipe entered into quite an elaborate narrative of the origin of the various sections of parties and concluded by saying there was another party in new york known as free soilers or abolitionists you have seen none of those in this part of the country i presume mr northup remarked never but one answered waddill laughingly we have one here in marksville an eccentric creature who preaches abolitionism as vehemently as any fanatic at the north he is a generous inoffensive man but always maintaining the wrong side of an argument it affords us a great deal of amusement he is an excellent mechanic and almost indispensable in this community he's a carpenter his name is bass some further good-natured conversation was had at the expense of bass's peculiarities when waddill all at once fell into a reflective mood and asked for the mysterious letter again let me see let me see he repeated thoughtfully to himself running his eyes over the letter once more bayou berth august fifteen august fifteen postmarked here he that is writing for me where did bass work last summer he inquired turning suddenly to his brother his brother was unable to inform him but rising left the office and soon returned with the intelligence that bass worked last summer somewhere on bayou berth he is the man bringing down his hand emphatically on the table who can tell us all about solomon northup exclaimed waddill bass was immediately searched for but could not be found after some inquiry it was ascertained he was at the landing on red river procuring a conveyance young waddill and northup were not long in traversing the few miles to the latter place on their arrival bass was found just on the point of leaving to be absent a fortnight or more after an introduction northup begged the privilege of speaking to him privately a moment they walked together towards the river when the following conversation ensued mr bass said northup allow me to ask you if you were on bayou berth last august yes sir i was there in august was the reply did you write a letter for a coloured man at that place to some gentleman in saratoga springs excuse me sir if i say that is none of your business answered bass stopping and looking his interrogator searchingly in the face perhaps i am rather hasty mr bass i beg your pardon but i have come from the state of new york to accomplish the purpose the writer of a letter dated the fifteenth of august postmarked at marksville had in view circumstances have led me to think that you are perhaps the man who wrote it i am in search of solomon northup if you know him i beg you to inform me frankly where he is and i assure you the source of any information you may give me shall not be divulged if you desire it not to be a long time bass looked his new acquaintance steadily in the eyes without opening his lips he seemed to be doubting in his own mind if there was not an attempt to practice some deception upon him finally he said deliberately i have done nothing to be ashamed of i am the man who wrote the letter if you have come to rescue solomon northup i am glad to see you when did you last see him and where is he northup inquired i last saw him christmas a week ago to-day he is the slave of edwin epps a planter on bayou berth near holmesville he is not known as solomon northup he is called platt the secret was out the mystery was unravelled through the thick black cloud amid whose dark and dismal shadows i had walked twelve years broke the star that was to light me back to liberty all mistrust and hesitation were soon thrown aside and the two men conversed long and freely upon the subject uppermost in their thoughts bass expressed the interest he had taken in my behalf his intention of going north in the spring and declaring that he had resolved to accomplish my emancipation if it were in his power he described the commencement and progress of his acquaintance with me and listened with eager curiosity to the account given him of my family and the history of my early life before separating he drew a map of the bayou on a strip of paper with a piece of red chalk showing the locality of epps plantation and the road leading most directly to it northup and his young companion returned to marksville 
where it was determined to commence legal proceedings to test the question of my right to freedom. I was made plaintiff, Mr Northup acting as my guardian, and Edwin Epps defendant. The process to be issued was in the nature of replevin, directed to the sheriff of the parish, commanding him to take me into custody and detain me until the decision of the court. By the time the papers were duly drawn up, it was twelve o'clock at night, too late to obtain the necessary signature of the judge, who resided some distance out of town. Further business was therefore suspended until Monday morning. Everything, apparently, was moving along swimmingly, until Sunday afternoon, when Waddill called at Northup's room to express his apprehension of difficulties they had not expected to encounter. Bass had become alarmed, and had placed his affairs in the hands of a person at the landing, communicating to him his intention of leaving the state. This person had betrayed the confidence reposed in him to a certain extent, and a rumour began to float about the town that the stranger at the hotel, who had been observed in the company of lawyer Waddill, was after one of old Epps's slaves, over on the bayou. Epps was known at Marksville, having frequent occasion to visit that place during the session of the courts, and the fear entertained by Mr Northup's adviser was that intelligence would be conveyed to him in the night, giving him an opportunity of secreting me before the arrival of the sheriff. This apprehension had the effect of expediting matters considerably. The sheriff, who lived in one direction from the village, was requested to hold himself in readiness immediately after midnight, while the judge was informed he would be called upon at the same time. It is but justice to say that the authorities at Marksville cheerfully rendered all the assistance in their power. As soon after midnight as bail could be perfected, and the judge's signature obtained, a carriage containing Mr Northup and the sheriff, driven by the landlord's son, rolled rapidly out of the village of Marksville on the road towards Bayou Berth. It was supposed that Epps would contest the issue involving my right to liberty, and it therefore suggested itself to Mr Northup that the testimony of the sheriff, describing my first meeting with the former, might perhaps become material on the trial. It was accordingly arranged during the ride that, before I had an opportunity of speaking to Mr Northup, the sheriff should propound to me certain questions agreed upon, such as the number and names of my children, the name of my wife before marriage, of places I knew at the north, and so forth. If my answers corresponded with the statements given him, the evidence must necessarily be considered conclusive. At length, shortly after Epps had left the field, with the consoling assurance that he would soon return and warm us, as was stated in the conclusion of the preceding chapter, they came in sight of the plantation and discovered us at work. Alighting from the carriage, and directing the driver to proceed to the great house, with instructions not to mention to any one the object of their errand until they met again, Northup and the sheriff turned from the highway and came towards us across the cotton field. We observed them, on looking up at the carriage, one several rods in advance of the other. It was a singular and unusual thing to see white men approaching us in that manner, and especially at that early hour in the morning, and Uncle Abram and Patsy made some remarks expressive of their astonishment. Walking up to Bob, the sheriff inquired, "'Where's the boy they call Platt?' "'There he is, massa,' answered Bob, pointing to me and twitching off his hat. I wondered to myself what business he could possibly have with me, and, turning round, gazed at him until he had approached within a step. During my long residence on the bayou, I had become familiar with the face of every planter within many miles. But this man was an utter stranger. Certainly I had never seen him before. "'Your name is Platt, is it?' he asked. "'Yes, master,' I responded. Pointing towards Northup, standing a few rods distant, he demanded, "'Do you know that man?' I looked in the direction indicated, and, as my eyes rested on his countenance, a world of images thronged my brain, a multitude of well-known faces. Anne's, and the dear children's, and my old dead father's, all the scenes and associations of childhood and youth, all the friends of other and happier days, appeared and disappeared, flitting and floating like dissolving shadows before the vision of my imagination, until, at last, the perfect memory of the man recurred to me, and, throwing up my hands towards heaven, I exclaimed, in a voice louder than I could utter in a less exciting moment, Henry B. Northup! Thank God! Thank God! 
in an instant i comprehended the nature of his business and felt that the hour of my deliverance was at hand i started towards him but the sheriff stepped before me stop a moment said he have you any other name than platt solomon northup is my name master i replied have you a family he inquired i had a wife and three children what were your children's names elizabeth margaret and alonzo and your wife's name before her marriage anne hampton who married you timothy eddy of fort edward where does that gentleman live again pointing to northup who remained standing in the same place where i had first recognized him he lives in sandy hill washington county new york was the reply he was proceeding to ask further questions but i pushed past him unable longer to restrain myself i seized my old acquaintance by both hands i could not speak i could not refrain from tears sol he said at length i'm glad to see you i essayed to make some answer but emotion choked all utterance and i was silent the slaves utterly confounded stood gazing upon the scene their opening mouths and rolling eyes indicating the utmost wonder and astonishment for ten years i had dwelt among them in the field and in the cabin borne the same hardships partaken the same fare mingled my griefs with theirs participated in the same scanty joys nevertheless not until this hour the last i was to remain among them had the remotest suspicion of my true name or the slightest knowledge of my real history been entertained by any one of them not a word was spoken for several minutes during which time i clung fast to northup looking up into his face fearful i should awake and find it all a dream throw down that sack northup added finally your cotton-picking days are over come with us to the man you live with i obeyed him and walking between him and the sheriff we moved towards the great house it was not until we had proceeded some distance that i had recovered my voice sufficiently to ask if my family were all living he informed me he had seen anne margaret and elizabeth but a short time previously that alonzo was also living and all were well my mother however i could never see again as i began to recover in some measure from the sudden and great excitement which so overwhelmed me i grew faint and weak insomuch it was with difficulty i could walk the sheriff took hold of my arm and assisted me or i think i should have fallen as we entered the yard epps stood by the gate conversing with the driver that young man faithful to his instructions was entirely unable to give him the least information in answer to his repeated inquiries of what was going on by the time we reached him he was almost as much amazed and puzzled as bob or uncle abram shaking hands with the sheriff and receiving an introduction to mr northup he invited them into the house ordering me at the same time to bring in some wood it was some time before i succeeded in cutting an armful having somehow unaccountably lost the power of wielding the axe with any manner of precision when i entered with it at last the table was strewn with papers from one of which northup was reading i was probably longer than necessity required in placing the sticks upon the fire being particular as to the exact position of each individual one of them i heard the words the said solomon northup and the deponent further says and free citizen of new york repeated frequently and from these expressions understood that the secret i had so long retained from master and mistress epps was finally developing i lingered as long as prudence permitted and was about leaving the room when epps inquired platt do you know this gentleman yes master i replied i have known him as long as i can remember where does he live he lives in new york did you ever live there yes master born and bred there you was free then now you damned nigger he exclaimed why did you not tell me that when i bought you master epps i answered in a somewhat different tone than the one in which i had been accustomed to address him master epps you did not take the trouble to ask me besides i told one of my owners the man that kidnapped me that i was free and was whipped almost to death for it it seems there's been a letter written for you by somebody now who is it he demanded authoritatively i made no reply i say who wrote that letter he demanded again perhaps i wrote it myself i said 
you haven't been to marksville post office and back before light i know he insisted upon my informing him and i insisted i would not he made many vehement threats against the man whoever he might be and intimated the bloody and savage vengeance he would wreak upon him when he found him out his whole manner and language exhibited a feeling of anger towards the unknown person who had written for me and of fretfulness at the idea of losing so much property addressing mr northup he swore if he had only had an hour's notice of his coming he would have saved him the trouble of taking me back to new york that he would have run me into the swamp or some other place out of the way where all the sheriffs on earth couldn't have found me i walked out into the yard and was entering the kitchen door when something struck me in the back aunt phoebe emerging from the back door of the great house with a pan of potatoes had thrown one of them with unnecessary violence thereby giving me to understand that she wished to speak to me a moment confidentially running up to me she whispered in my ear with great earnestness laura mighty platt what do you think dem two men come after you heard em tell massa you free got wife and three children back there where you come from goin wid em fool if you don't wish i could go and aunt phoebe ran on in this manner at a rapid rate presently mistress epps made her appearance in the kitchen she said many things to me and wondered why i had not told her who i was she expressed her regret complimenting me by saying she had rather lose any other servant on the plantation had patsy that day stood in my place the measure of my mistress joy would have overflowed now there was no one left who could mend a chair or a piece of furniture no one who was of any use about the house no one who could play for her on the violin and mistress epps was actually affected to tears epps had called to bob to bring up his saddle horse the other slaves also overcoming their fear of the penalty had left their work and come to the yard they were standing behind the cabins out of sight of epps they beckoned me to come to them and with all the eagerness of curiosity excited to the highest pitch conversed with and questioned me if i could repeat the exact words they uttered with the same emphasis if i could paint their several attitudes and the expression of their countenances it would be indeed an interesting picture in their estimation i had suddenly arisen to an immeasurable height had become a being of immense importance the legal papers having been served and arrangements made with epps to meet them the next day at marksville northup and the sheriff entered the carriage to return to the latter place as i was about mounting to the driver's seat the sheriff said i ought to bid mr and mrs epps good-bye i ran back to the piazza where they were standing and taking off my hat said good-bye missus good-bye platt said mrs epps kindly good-bye master ugh you damned nigger muttered epps in a surly malicious tone of voice you needn't feel so cussed tickled you ain't gone yet i'll see about this business at marksville to-morrow i was only a nigger and knew my place but felt as strongly as if i had been a white man that it would have been an inward comfort had i dared to have given him a parting kick on my way back to the carriage patsy ran from behind a cabin and threw her arms about my neck oh platt she cried tears streaming down her face you're going to be free you're going way off yonder where we'll never see you any more you saved me a good many whippings platt i'm glad you're going to be free but oh dear lord dear lord what'll become of me i disengaged myself from her and entered the carriage the driver cracked his whip and away we rolled i looked back and saw patsy with drooping head half reclining on the ground mrs epps was on the piazza uncle abram and bob and wiley and aunt phoebe stood by the gate gazing after me i waved my hand but the carriage turned a bend of the bayou hiding them from my eyes for ever we stopped a moment at carey's sugar house where a great number of slaves were at work such an establishment being a curiosity to a northern man epps dashed by us on horseback at full speed on the way as we learn next day to the pine woods to see william ford who had brought me into the country tuesday the fourth of january epps and his counsel the hon h taylor northup waddill the judge and sheriff of avoyelles and myself met in a room in the village of marksville 
mr northup stated the facts in regard to me and presented his commission and the affidavits accompanying it the sheriff described the scene in the cotton field i was also interrogated at great length finally mr taylor assured his client that he was satisfied and that litigation would not only be expensive but utterly useless in accordance with his advice a paper was drawn up and signed by the proper parties wherein epps acknowledged he was satisfied of my right to freedom and formally surrendered me to the authorities of new york it was also stipulated that it be entered of record in the recorder's office of avoyel see appendix c mr northup and myself immediately hastened to the landing and taking passage on the first steamer that arrived were soon floating down red river up which with such desponding thoughts i had been born twelve years before End of chapter 21